What's going on guys? This is Thomas and this is Photocast episode 15. Our community is now a total of 33 countries and growing and that's just amazing. I want to thank you so much for all your support. I'm back on my regular weekly schedule so you can check back each and every Tuesday for a new episode. Today's podcast is about the small details that create great wildlife images. When I say small details, I mean all the small details that go into creating great images, including deciding the camera angle, compositional decisions, the direction and the quality of the sun, background choices, the body angle of the animal, and the head angle of the animal. After thoroughly discussing small decisions we make in the field, We're going to end the podcast with Tuesday's news, the informative random fact of the week, and ending the episode with the loved, researched, tested, and photocast approved gear of the week. If you want to talk to me, I'm always happy to chat on Instagram at outback underscore photo underscore adventures, or you can email me by going to my photo bag company's website, www.alotechgear. Dot com, which is alotechgear.com. Before we get into today's episode, I just want to remind you that you can get my free guide on post-processing wildlife photos in both Lightroom and Photoshop instantly by going to alotechgear.com. Just click on the button that appears after like five seconds when you're on the website and then download your free guide. Now let's jump in to episode 15. Each and every time you go into the field and photograph animals, you subconsciously make so many decisions that either help you create an awesome photo or hurt you by helping you create an average photo. Each and every decision you make, even though they're small, all add up to have such a large impact on each and every one of our final images. As we continue to improve as wildlife photographers, We should look to improve each and every small detail we make in the field because this will allow us to photograph better and better images as the years pass. Starting from the beginning, the biggest mistake that each and every one of us has made when we all started out as wildlife photographers is not focusing on the angle of the camera. The camera angle in relation to animals we are photographing is one of the biggest decisions because it has such a profound impact on each and every photo we take. I'm sure you're all aware, but generally pointing your camera down towards the animal really does not yield pleasing results most of the time. Just think about it this way. Imagine you're in a plane taking a photo of a moose in a forest. If you're in a regular flight, the moose will look like an ant. This is why pointing your camera down on an animal makes a subject smaller, less intimidating, and less powerful. Also, your background can start to become distracting because it is so much closer in relation to the animal compared to some distant tree line if you're laying down. Instead of being lazy and wanting to keep your clothes clean, you should photograph an animal from the ground level because you'll improve your photos instantly. In so many situations, I always try and tilt my lens up to frame the animal because it makes them look larger than life. Also, your background now becomes some distant object that can easily be blown out. So the viewer's focus can now be on the animal. Getting dirty is fun and it's really part of being a wildlife photographer. I've really done anything to get the lowest angle possible, including laying on snow, to photograph animals like polar bears and coyotes, laying in the muck to photograph shorebirds, laying on rocks and getting hit with waves of water to photograph penguins and ducks, and wading in saltwater lagoons in Florida and placing my lens inches above the water to get the ultimate angle for herons. Now, of course, when you know a rule exists, then it's meant to be broken. There are many situations when photographing with an angle slightly down on an animal can help you achieve that photo you really want in your head. 
The easy ex example is picture you're waiting in a Florida saltwater lagoon on a Sunday morning to photograph herons. We want to create a headshot and a tripod is already set up about an inch above the water to get the lowest angle possible. Now with our lenses so low, we have a tree line in the background, which is a dark green color. That is not the color we want, because when we think of herons, we think of water, which is blue. So we want this headshot to have an awesome, rich blue color in the background. So what we do is we extend our tripods and have our lens slightly angled down on the heron, enough to have the water of the heron that they're standing in be the background of our photo. Another example of photographing at an angle that looks down on an animal could be headshots of something like a bird directly looking at you, which creates a really cool headshot. Or you can even angle your camera down on the subject to include something in the environment, like flowers. Now moving on to the next small decision that each and every one of us makes, and that's composition. When I mean composition, it's either choosing to photograph an animal horizontally or vertically. For some strange reason, so many photographers rarely ever turn their cameras to photograph an animal with a vertical composition. A good reason many photographers don't do this is when we started out, the camera with one shutter button that we used caused photographing vertically to feel awkward when you get an internally rotated shoulder and your hand now on top of the camera. An easy solution for this problem is to get a battery grip that has an additional shutter button on the bottom of the camera, or use a camera grip with one built in. I personally love to photograph animals vertically. I think animals that are a lot taller than they are wide is more pleasing photo when composed vertically. The same can be said about birds that are flying and bank back to the camera with their wings fully spread. Also, another bonus for shooting vertically more is that now your photos can be on the front cover of magazines. The opposite holds true also. I also love to photograph animals that are a lot wider than they are tall horizontally because I think it creates a nicer image. The bonus for shooting horizontally is that the photo can now be used as a DPS or double page spread in magazines. The next detail we should all talk about is one I'm sure you've heard of before and it's called the rule of thirds. Basically, it's just a fancy tic-tac-toe board. To follow the rule of thirds, all you have to do is place the animal in your frame on one of the four points of intersection depending on what direction the animal is facing. Our goal as wildlife photographers is to capture a scene and allow the viewers of our photo to feel like they were there when you took the photo. So we want to create natural looking photos. For example, if an animal is walking to the right, we want them on the left hand side of our frame because we need to give the animal part of the scene to walk into. The exact same principle holds true if the animal is walking to the left. We want to frame the animal on the right hand side of our frame because again, we need to give the animal space to walk into. A good general rule is to place the animal on one of the four points of intersection. However, many times you will be too close to the animal to do this. When I'm close, what I like to do is I like to put the animal's eye on one of the four points of intersection, depending on the direction the animal is facing. Now you might even be closer to an animal photographing headshots, and placing the eye could be impossible because you could be cutting off part of the animal's face. However, you can still follow the rule of thirds because if the animal, like a coyote, is facing to the right, you can have the eye in the center of the frame but just leave some dead space on the right hand side of your photo to give the animal a little bit of room to look into. Just like any rule in photography, when you know they exist, you can break them. One of my favorite times to break the rule of thirds and not put an animal on the point of intersection is when an animal is walking directly towards me. Let's say we're photographing a moose 
that is walking directly at us. Photographing the moose from a low angle with the bull dead center in our frames with eye contact can create such an intimidating and powerful photo. Another time I often break the rule of thirds is headshots. The next decision we make is determining the direction of the sun that illuminates the animal we're photographing. The way I think about lighting is this, highlights illuminate and shadows define. I personally think shadows play an integral role in our images because they give our photos a three-dimensional look and feel. When you're in the field, there are three basic sun angles you can choose. Front lighting, side lighting, and back lighting. Starting with front lighting, it's directly how it sounds. The light comes from in front of the camera, directly over your head. Side lighting comes from the left hand side or the right hand side of the frame. And back lighting comes from behind the animal. My personal favorite lighting is between front lighting and side lighting because it's a natural looking angle for portraits. I love this angle of lighting because it casts a great light on the animal, but the lighting also creates some shadows that bring out the details in the animals. Remember that the best quality of light comes from around the golden hours of sunrise and sunset. Another decision we make in the field is choosing our backgrounds, and this can either make or break our photos. Every time you approach a scene, you need to ask yourself, what do you want the viewer of your photo to focus on? Is it the animal, the animal in some subject, or the animal in the environment? Let's start with just wanting the viewer of our photo to focus on the animal. If we only want the focus to be on the animal, we need to minimize all other distractions in the photo. We can do this by changing our camera's angle to make sure that annoying twigs or rocks isn't in the frame anymore. We can change the angle of our camera so the background is also not distracting. And we can even shoot wide open to blow out the background. Now let's say we want two aspects in our frame to be in the viewer's focus. For example, we want the snow and the animal to be in focus. Now we might have to stop down our lens just a little bit to get some detail in the snow. We also want to keep our background non-distracting, so we might want to choose a background that is really far away from our subject. Lastly, if we want an animal in the environment to be the focus in our photos, then we really need to make sure we stop our apertures down and pay attention to the framing. One framing option I love to do is when photographing on uneven terrain is to have the mound start in one corner of our frame and extend towards the opposite direction. As you progress as a wildlife photographer, the next detail that you should really pay attention to is the body angle of the animal. My personal favorite body angle of animals is to have them either walking slightly towards us or walking directly at us. I personally think most of the photos with animals walking slightly away from the camera or butt shots are really not that pleasing. However, just like any rules, they are meant to be broken. An example is when I was snowshoeing up a mountain in Wyoming with a group of bighorn sheep, I decide to approach them from the direction they are walking away from. Now I did this because I wanted to show how these sheep create their own trails they use to traverse the mountains in the winter. Now the last detail I want to talk to you about today is the animal's head angle. I personally think that just like the body angle, the most pleasing head angle is when the animal is slightly looking towards the camera, just a few degrees. In some situations, directly at the camera can create a more intimidating look. Again, these are two general rules and they're meant to be broken. I really hope you learned about the small details that add up to make our photos more pleasing. I hope you're more cognizant in the field about making choices like deciding the camera angle, compositional decisions, the direction and the quality of the sun, background choices, the body angle of the animal, and the head angle of the animal. Now that wraps up today's talk, so now let's get into Tuesday's news.
This segment is for many of us that are, a lot of times, disconnected from the photo world, knowing some current news might help you. Starting with Canon, some really interesting news that came from Canon rumors is that Canon patented 500mm f4 DO and 600mm f4 DO designs. This could be great because the Super Tele lenses could hopefully get smaller and a lot more lighter, making traveling with our gear more enjoyable and easier. Now moving on to Nikon. From Nikon rumors, there's a cool third-party adapter for converting manual focus lenses to autofocus lenses for the Z mount, which is really cool. Now onto the informative random fact of the week. Did you know the Florida scrub jay is the only bird that's solely located in Florida and not in any other state? Now to the last section, the loved, researched, tested, and photocast approved gear of the week. This week, I really want to talk about something we all give each other in the field all the time, and that's business cards. For me, I've used Moo business cards, which is M-O-O, for years because they're awesome. The reason I love my Moo cards is because they have awesome picture quality, so I print a photo on one side with my information on the other. For me, I have a vertical version of a black skimmer chick hugging its parent's beak on one side of the card with the other side of the card having my information like my name, my phone number, my email, and my Instagram. The best thing about these cards is that when you order something like 100, you can have, for example, 5 different photos with 20 cards per photo so you don't have to hand the same card with the same photo to everyone. Business cards are awesome because I've gotten print orders from people I see in the field that have seen an animal, the exact same one I'm photographing, and they rarely see them every day. So they want to buy the photo for their memories. And I've gotten many guiding clients from handing out my card after talking to someone in the field for a while. I personally love standardized business cards with a matte finish. If you want to check them out, just go to the show notes at thephotocast.com and click on the links for more information. That wraps up episode 15. You couldn't help me out with one small favor, could you? You wouldn't happen to know just one person, someone who just like you, that would benefit from listening to the photocast. If you could just send them the link to your friend or colleague, I would truly appreciate it. Lastly, I'm really trying to grow this podcast so I can keep putting out as much information as possible. To allow me to continue this, it would help out our community so much if you could rate this podcast five stars and leave a nice review. What this does is it helps our ranking in iTunes so more people can join our community. Thank you so much for all your help and support. I really appreciate you and I'll talk to you next week.